Hi everyone, welcome to my messy studio. My name is Mark and I'm an artist, an art teacher, and a fountain pen addict. In this video, we're going to be looking at three interesting pens in the $20 to $50 price range from the perspective of someone who uses their fountain pens for drawing. Some time ago, I posted a review of five inexpensive fountain pens, most of them under $20. That video was well received with something like 27,000 views to date, which demonstrates that there's a lot of interest in using fountain pens to draw, but that many people are looking for quality pens at that lower price point. And look, I completely understand. If you're an artist that uses a tip pen or a felt tip pen, even $20 for a fountain pen might give you sticker shock. The problem is that while there are gems in that under $20 price range, the Muji pen, for example, which continues to be one of my favorites, the build quality on most pens under $20 is pretty shoddy. Case in point is this Jinhao X159, which I gave a gushingly positive review, but that just a few weeks later broke on me. I believe I paid under $10 for it, so no great loss, but I think we can all agree that we need to cut down on the production and consumption of cheap disposable stuff. As I mentioned in my review of the cheaper pens, the issue isn't whether cheap pens work, because often they work just fine, but rather for how long. Most of those cheap pens, like that unfortunate Jinhao, feel like they have a self-destruct button, where they work, and then as a result of nothing, you find them leaking everywhere or broken into a bunch of pieces. The great news is that once you push into the $25 to $50 price range, there are great options that perform extremely well and have decent build quality. Some of them I've already talked about and at length, such as the pens made by PenBBS and Narwhal. But in this video, we're going to talk about three pens that are relatively new to the market, two of them made by Asfian, the V126 and the P36, and one made by Moonman, the C4. Let's get started with the Moonman C4. And here it is. This is a long, chunky pen, capped, measuring almost 6 inches, but because the cap is enormous, it becomes more normal sized uncapped at a little bit over 5 inches. The pen body, besides the piston rod, is almost entirely plastic, so despite the large size, the pen is quite light. It doesn't post, but is comfortable enough to be used unposted. Let's look at the ergonomics. While the grip section is on the shorter side, the threads are shallow and smooth, so you can place your fingers on them, and it even adds to the ability to grip the pen. Plastic grip sections, no matter how polished, always have a gentle tack to them, and never feel slippery or slick. I also like that the step up from the grip section is slight, allowing me to quickly shift my fingers from the grip section to the barrel without catching against anything. Overall, I find that this pen sits very well in the hand. The solid piece of acrylic in the back might have made the pen feel back heavy if it was a touch longer, but this pen is short enough so that the solid piece sits firmly in the pad between your thumb and index finger and somehow its weight feels anchoring, giving you more stability. This is something I've been noticing lately, that the weight on the back of the pen actually makes it more stable to hold provided that the pen is short enough. I usually don't dwell on appearances in pens, but here I have to put in a few words. The pen body is attractive with handsome proportions, sleek and rounded crystal clear acrylic, and pretty threading in the piston knob. But what is going on with the cap? It's bulky, long, and feels completely out of place, and the stubby clip is ridiculous looking. This is one of the ugliest cap designs I have ever seen, not helped at all by the tacky gold plating. This is a terrible shame given how comfortable and well designed the pen body is. But looks aside, the best thing about this pen is the filling system. Moonman has produced several eyedropper fillers, but this one has a mechanism that seals the ink reservoir from the smaller reservoir connected to the feed. Turning the knob in the back unscrews the rod, opening the main reservoir allowing ink to enter the smaller reservoir here. You can write with the main reservoir open, or if you choose to seal it off, the pen will write for some time before it needs to be reopened. This unique feature that, as far as I know, only exists on Opus 88 pens and some Japanese vintage models prevents burping and dripping, a very common problem in eyedropper pens, and also allows you to safely take your pen on airplanes. To my mind, it's the ideal filling system for artists. I often dilute my inks, and with this pen, I can mix my dilutions inside the pen body. It also eliminates the problem of having to fill a pen from a bottle with very low ink levels. Best of all, you have massive ink capacity, without any of the problems that plague eye drop fillers. And this pen is very easy to clean, since you can remove the grip section from the barrel and give everything a good flush. 
I absolutely love this filling system in my Opus 88 pens, but those are pricey pens, most costing over $100, so I'm very happy to see this filling system on a far less expensive pen. Now let's talk about the nib. This pen has an extra fine number 6 Moonman nib. Let's take it out for a test drive and see how it performs on my four step test. In the consistency test, to see if this pen will put down a line without skipping in any direction at any speed, this pen actually performed well. I say actually because that has not been my experience with several other Moonman models. Here the pen puts down a very crisp, extra fine line and does so very consistently. Well done Moonman C4. The consistency of the nib is for me the most important aspect and probably why I put it first in my tests. I can tolerate a nib that has no flex, or one that is scratchy, or too wet, but if a nib skips, I immediately lose my patience with it and stop using it. And that's one of the main differences between a cheap and a quality pen. With a cheap pen, you never know what you're going to get. Sometimes the nib is just fine, and sometimes it skips all over the place. And, by the way, some extremely expensive pens also sometimes come with inconsistent nibs. And, shame on them, they should also be avoided. In the line variation test, this pen showed itself to have negligible flexibility. You can tease out a slightly wider line with pressure, but that might be the result of the tip digging into the paper rather than the spreading of the tines. I'm going to rank this as a nail, a 0.5 on my 1 through 10 flexibility scale. It does reverse right, however, putting down a super wispy, consistent, extra, extra, extra fine line. In the smoothness test, it's not bad at all, considering the fineness of the nib. This will be dependent on the paper, of course, but I find the slight feedback here very pleasant. Fine nibs can sometimes scratch your paper when you apply too many layers of hatching, and this one doesn't. In the wetness test, this pen showed itself to be very dry, just like all the Moonman nibs. This dryness will be dependent on the kind of ink used, of course, but here I'm using Diamine Matador, which is one of my wettest. The last test is to simply draw with a pen since it's only after extended use that you can see a pen's pluses and minuses. In this case, however, this pen was a pleasure to work with even after several hours. The line is quite thin, as you can see, and the dryness is perfect for a drawing style that employs lots of busy, multi-layered hatching. One thing this drawing test did reveal was that reverse writing was not as reliable as the initial test suggested. It started off well, but ran dry after a minute or so. The reverse writing will start up again if you flip the pen back for a bit and draw with it, but will quickly stop working. Oh well, considering how thin the lines are in regular writing, I'm willing to give the inconsistent reverse writing a pass. By the way, if you require a thicker line, you can get nib units that range from fine to broad. Also, the nib can be removed from its housing unit, and because it's a number 6 size, can be replaced with many other nib options. So, to conclude, this really is the perfect pen for artists, a poor man's Opus 88 demonstrator. The pen body is comfortable, the filling mechanism gives you the giant ink capacity of an eyedropper without the dripping and burping, making it easy to maintain and clean, and the number 6 nib gives you a lot of versatility. If it wasn't for the incongruous, hideous cap, this really would be an absolutely affordable gem, perfect for the artist on a budget. These next two pens are made by a new, exciting entrant into the fountain pen market, Asphine. Let's talk about the first one, the V126. In terms of design, this pen looks like a knockoff of the Pilot Custom A23, having a very similar shape and length. The A23 is one of my favorite pen bodies, for me, having the ideal weight and balance. And this pen is very similar, having a comfortable, long grip section, with threads pushed far enough down so that the fingers don't catch against them. The attractive frosted finish ensures that the grip isn't slick, and because it extends all the way down the body, it allows me to get a good grip on it anywhere. The pen capped is just short of 6 inches, and comes in slightly under 5 inches uncapped. And while it posts securely, for some reason it posts more shallowly than the A23, making it a little bit back heavy. However, that's really not a big deal because it's perfectly comfortable writing unposted. Overall, the build quality feels very impressive. There are a few indications of manufacturing shortcuts here and there, such as the roughness of the finish on the gold-plated metal pieces. But considering that this pen is under $30, you really can't complain. 
When it comes to build quality at this price point, you have the right to expect a pen with smooth threading, no rattling parts, something that doesn't feel like it's about to come apart. However, as far as minor details go, such as the cheap finish of the gold plating, I wouldn't nitpick too much. Besides the excellent ergonomics, the great thing about this pen is the vacuum filling system. My second favorite way to fill a pen behind the eyedropper with a stopper mechanism of the previous pen that I showed you. With this system, you get the wonderful ink capacity, or at least the potential of it since getting a complete fill with vac fillers is tricky. You also get the two reservoir system that keeps the pen from burping and allows you to fly with it. The only disadvantage is that you need a bottle with enough ink to get a good fill. And this pen actually has a feature that's an improvement on the Pilot A23, the ability to unscrew the grip section, allowing you to clean the pen thoroughly without having to use a special wrench to unscrew it from the back. As someone who switches inks often, this ease of cleaning is a big, big plus. Now let's look at the nib, which is an extra fine number six steel Asphine branded nib and do my four part test. In the consistency department, this pen performed fairly well, though there are a few places where there was some skipping, which might be due to my own error rather than the pens, something we'll be able to figure out when we actually start drawing with it. The line is slightly thicker than the one on the Moonman C4, which is okay since the fineness there was perhaps too much for everyday drawing. In the line variation department, it's very stiff, perhaps even stiffer than the Moonman, if such a thing is possible, ranking at 0.25 on my 1 through 10 scale. However, in reverse writing, it's not reliable, sometimes putting down an extra, extra, extra fine line and sometimes drying up. In the feedback test, this pen performed pretty well, given the fineness of the nib. I prefer less feedback on my nibs, and there was definitely some scratchiness on this one, even on very smooth paper. However, I think a few passes on a micromesh can smooth this nib right out and make it right to my liking. In the wetness test, I found the nib to be very dry. This can quickly be corrected by pulling the shoulders of the nib back a little, which loosens the tines and increases flow. That said, this is a great pen for busy crosshatching on smooth paper, allowing you to put down a huge number of layers without making things too wet. Let's draw with a pen and give my overall impression. I think Asphine hit it out of the park here, offering a comfortable, well-built pen with excellent ink capacity that's also easy to clean. And best of all, you can get it for under $40. For those of you new to the fountain pens, let's take a second to appreciate the significance of this. Not so long ago, vacuum fillers were the exclusive purview of the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts, with such pens as the Pilot 823 and the even pricier Visconti Homo Sapiens being out of reach to the humble artists. Now there's quite a few affordable vacuum fillers, including the Twisby Vac 700R, the Pen BBS 456, the newer version of the Narwhal Demonstrator, and now this one, the Aspian V126, which out of the four inexpensive vac fillers that I own, is the one I recommend. I was initially interested in the pen solely for the pen body, expecting to be entirely underwhelmed by the nib. To my surprise, the nib is pretty good considering the price, and if you desire something better, it can easily be popped out with many other number six options. However, considering how much time I spend on this channel fawning over flexible nibs, I actually enjoy occasionally working with stiff nibs because they allow me to put down many, many layers of consistent hatching, and this is a great option for working in this style. And though I haven't had this pen for very long, and will definitely report back if I have any issues, so far it feels rock solid. Yes, it's a knockoff in terms of design, but the original design, the Pilot Custom 823, with its oft-repeated torpedo shape, isn't original either. So I don't think anyone should have ethics issues with buying this pen. Let's talk about another pen by Asphine, the P36. This is another large pen, being 5 and 3 quarter inches capped, and a touch under five and a quarter inches uncapped. While you can post this pen, it posts very shallowly with the cap on the piston knob, making it very long and unusable. Making a pen with a combination of metal and plastic parts has its challenges in terms of balance, but Asphine got it exactly right here. The use of titanium in the grip section and the piston makes the pen light but substantial, and the balance is just perfect. Furthermore, this hourglass grip section is very well designed, long, with a very shallow threading here that doesn't catch against the fingers, and actually functions to add extra stability to the grip. 
Metal grip sections are usually very slippery, but the shape and micro texturing here makes the grip super stable, one of the best I've experienced. I try not to get too enthusiastic in my reviews since such hyperbolic praise loses its power if overused, but here is some hyperbolic praise. The ergonomics of this pen are just superb, some of the best I've ever experienced. I should note that this pen is also clearly a knockoff design, this time of the Conid bulk filler king size. In this case, however, the copying of the design is problematic, since unlike the A23, the designers at Conid took great lengths to develop a beautifully sleek product. However, given that there's something like a $900 price difference between these two pens, I don't think damage is being done to Conan's business, at least that's how I'm justifying this purchase. This pen has a piston filling system, which after the eye dropper and the vacuum is my third favorite way of filling a pen. It comes in third because the piston limits the incapacity, and you have the lack of the double reservoir system, which means that you have to empty the pen on flights. The other thing that I dislike is that disassembling the pen to fully clean it is a tremendous hassle, requiring a special wrench, and I found that even after watching and rewatching tutorials on disassembly and reassembly, I can never get the piston to align right on the back of the pen. And the grip section doesn't unscrew either, so cleaning this pen is a bigger hassle than the Asphian V126. As for the nib performance, you have the option of going either with a number 6 Asphian branded nib, or for a few dollars extra, a nib made by Bach. Since I already bought one with the Asphian nib, I decided to go with an extra fine Bach. By the way, unlike the previous nib, the nib and feed here are friction fit, which for me is a plus, since it makes switching nibs and cleaning the pen easier than if the nib was fitted into a housing unit. Let's take this pen out for a test drive and do my four-part test. Bach nibs are very consistent, and I've rarely had any issues with them, and in the few cases where problems were encountered, it was due to a simple nib misalignment and could easily be fixed. True to Bach form, this nib performed perfectly in all directions and at all speeds. This one puts down an extra fine line, slightly wider than the previous Asphian branded nib. In terms of line variation, the nib performed better than the Asphian, providing a touch of flex. I found that Bach nibs tend to be slightly bouncier than the ones made by Yovo, the other large manufacturer whose nibs are used in quite a few brands. This one I would rank at about a 2.5 on the flexibility scale, with three given to nibs that are considered soft, with pounds like the Pilot Falcon sitting at about 3.5 or 4. This pen is also a very reliable reverse writer, putting down an extra, extra fine line. In terms of smoothness, this pen is very nice, being much smoother than the Asphian nib, but perhaps this is due to putting down a slightly wider line. Bach nibs are generally smoother than Yovo nibs, but really both are excellent, and I don't have a preference between the two in terms of smoothness. Both are very pleasant to work with. And in terms of wetness, this is also ideal, just wet enough for my busy, multi-layered hatching style, good for all kinds of paper without soaking or feathering. Okay, let's draw with this pen and see how it performs in practice and with extended use. I might as well tell you now that I'm absolutely in love with this pen. The weight and proportions feel just about perfect and that grip section can't be more comfortable with the ideal shape and degree of tackiness. And though I usually don't care too much about the appearance of my pens, I'm enamored with the elegant proportions and striking combination of clear acrylic and brushed titanium. This is a wonderful design that makes me wish I could own an actual Conan bulk filler, which is sure to happen as soon as I win the lottery. As mentioned, there are some drawbacks to the pen, one of which is that the grip section doesn't unscrew, which means that you have to fully disassemble the piston mechanism to clean the pen fully, which as I also mentioned, can be a huge hassle. While the friction fit nib design makes it easier to switch nibs, it also comes with a slight disadvantage. Notice the little smudge of ink on the chest. That's caused by a drop of ink, which happened because I didn't push the nib deep enough after switching it with another one of my nibs. With a housing unit, such things usually don't occur. Despite the drawbacks, at $45, you'll be hard pressed to do better. I think Asphine has hit it out of the park again, providing another solid, affordable option that is very competitive in an already crowded price point. That concludes my review of these three cheapish pens in the $25 to $50 price range. While there are cheaper pens, pens in the $25 and under category, that are absolutely worth getting, 
and there are arguments to be made for spending over $50 and up for a pen, I feel that the $25 to $50 category is really the ideal range for artists. This is the range where you start encountering more solid build quality, higher quality nibs, and can also expect to get a pen that works well and lasts a long time. Of course, once you go over 50, there are also plenty of excellent options to be sure, but for me, that's when I start to feel uneasy about taking a pen everywhere. By sticking to the 25 through 50 price point, you'll get a reliable, durable, well-performing pen that you won't be coddling or be too afraid to lose. Furthermore, this to my mind is really the most exciting category at the moment, with new brands and new pens entering the market all the time, so you have plenty of options to choose from. Please let me know what pens you enjoy using in this price range. Perhaps I'll try them and include them in a follow-up video to this one. I hope you found this video useful, and if you did, please subscribe and stay tuned to many more reviews like this one. Thanks for watching, and hopefully you see you next time.